My perspective is I, I don't like to tell people like, oh, in 10 sessions, you're going to start you know feeling better because chances are good something else is going to happen in your life. And you're going to realize like, wow, I've been working on all these things. Now I have these new skills. And I'm also more mindful of like how I'm reacting or how my loved ones are reacting. So you're going to just want to start processing more. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 113 of the Command of Voice. Today I speak with the founder of Soundview Wellness and Cactus & Co. Please welcome Dr. Caitlin Gubo. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, Subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. On this episode, I got to speak with Dr. Caitlin Gubo, uh, who is the founder of both Soundview Wellness and Cactus & Co., uh, both of which are located here on Camino Island at Camino Commons. Uh, Soundview Wellness, for those of you who don't know, is located above Pope Chiropractic in Building A, which is the same building that has Brooklyn Brothers Pizzeria. Uh, and then her other business, Cactus & Co., is located right above uh, Brooklyn Brothers Pizzeria. So uh, be sure to check those out if you haven't already. <clears throat> the Cactus & Co. has a bunch of great plants. Uh, so it's a great little plant shop and some things that are unusual that you, you maybe won't find at other places. So be sure to check those out. Um, but today we get to talk about all the different aspects of, of kind of counseling, why it's important, and, and the, sh the steps and strives forward that it's made over the last probably like 10 years or so. Um, and we talk about how Kate, Dr. Caitlin got uh, started in counseling and why she has a passion for it, uh, and how she's taken it into the social work aspect of it as well. So we get into all of that and more. This is going to be part one of the podcast, so be sure to come back for part two next week. Uh, but without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Caitlin Gubo. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Command of Voice. Today, I'm here with the founder of Soundview Wellness and Cactus & Co. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Caitlin uh, Gubo. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Caitlin. Yeah. So um, I grew up here um, in Stanwood. Um, I went to Stanwood High School. Um, and then I went away to school. Um, and at that time I was really just excited to get out of Stanwood and see what <laughs> else was in the world. Yeah. Um, but, but then after, um, graduating, I, I did come home and actually got my master's and my doctorate online through okay. the university of Southern California. So, okay. um, and that kind of school has been sort of my like identity for a really long time. My yeah. passion. Um, I love to learn and go to school and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of been sort of who I've been lately. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. So, uh, growing up in Stanwood, what was that like for you? Well, I mean, then it was way smaller than it is now. Yes. Um, and so, I mean, it was nice. I really liked, you know, living out on a farm and <clears> having <throat> lots of space and the small town vibe. It was really good. Yeah. Um, and I loved, you know, school and friends and being involved in activities and stuff like that. So, yeah. 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 Stanwood's gone through quite an evolution, uh, especially over the last 20 years. Yeah, it really has. So and it's fun to come back and see just like how much it has changed mm -hmm. for sure. So. Yeah. Nice. So yeah. then where did you end up going to school uh, for your uh, undergrad? I went to Gonzaga University. Oh, you did? Yeah, okay. so I was over in Spokane. Um, close enough that I could come home, but far enough to, you know, try new things and be independent, yeah. too. So it was yeah. really good. How was that moving to Spokane versus living in Sandwood? I mean, it felt like a big city for someone who, you know, didn't know the big city life. Yeah. But um, it was, you know still had a lot of components that felt sort of small town vibe-ish. I love Spokane. I would definitely like live there. Yeah. Um, it, it's beautiful, has all the seasons, really nice people, um, but still big enough that you can do lots of different things and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. When my wife and I, well, when I was going to college, um, my wife and I got married and then moved over to Pullman and I mm -hmm. was going through college and she was working to put us through, put me through college. Um, but our like dates, like overnight big mm -hmm. thing was to Spokane. Yeah. 
Definitely. And we would do that for overnight. And we loved Spokane. It mm-hmm. was, um, you know, we grew up uh, in this area as well. So we grew up going down to Seattle and hanging out yeah. there. Um, but Seattle, when you're down there, uh, especially when you're younger or like you're kind of new to on your own, yeah. like it's overwhelming. There's right. so much and like the traffic, everything, it feels yeah. like very, da- not dangerous, but just like you're just overwhelmed. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I remember when we went to Spokane, like we just walked everywhere mm-hmm. and we just loved all the different aspects of it. Yeah. Um, we would go to that downtown mall area mm-hmm. and then they've got the ice ring there. Yeah. And, um, yeah. We just loved walking that entire mm-hmm. area. Yeah. And it has lots of different like cool aspects, historic districts and, you know, you go to the valley or you could go, you know, north or south. Either way is yeah. just a whole different vibe. And so I really like that too. Yeah. 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 No, it was, it was um, definitely a special place that we enjoyed to go out mm-hmm. to. And as far as the city is concerned, like it didn't feel like a overwhelming city. Um, right. But it had that kind of energy, but right. then also that small town feel. Yeah, so I really definitely. For so sure. We definitely, I got lost when we went there the first time though, because I was trying to drive up, there's the main, one of the main roads, I think it's Sprague. Yeah. That is one way for a good chunk of it. Yeah. And I kept trying to go the other way. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. all I need to go is up a little ways and then turn right, but I yeah. can't. Yeah. So it was... would definitely, that was my <laughs> first experience with one ways and there's a lot of one ways in Spokane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It feels like you're going down a river and like you can only go this one direction. Yes. So true. <laughs> so very cool. Yeah. So you went, um, got your graduate undergraduate and what was your undergraduate in? Um, it was in sociology. Okay. Yeah. So nice. at, at that time, I really, I mean, I loved people and just kind of working with anybody, talking to anybody. Um, and I just was really curious to see like, you know, how society functions and how I can learn more about that to help people. Um, and at that time, my intention was to go to law school okay. um, until I, I had like this amazing professor mentor who was like, I don't think you really want to go to law school. I think you want to become a social worker. Um, and so that's actually, I just, I did my LSATs and I got into some schools and I just really didn't want to move and it wasn't super exciting. So I just applied for the last uh, master's program that was open and got in. And so that's kind of where it led me. Okay. So, and yeah. what was the master's program then? In social work. So it master's okay. of social work. Yeah. So is there, I'm, I always get confused with uh, doctors and masters. Yeah. Um, Cause I never went past undergrad. Yeah. Um, In master's, do you specialize or is it still kind of general? Yeah, I mean, you specialize in specifically like clinical social work or a type of social work. Um, And then, I mean, but it's still pretty broad. Um, Mm -hmm. But you can definitely make it more narrow if you know specifically what you want to do. I didn't. So I kind of kept a more broad track. Yeah. Yeah. So what what was your thought in going into that? And especially making that U-turn from law into social work. Um, what yeah. was that, uh, what was kind of your plan going into that then? Yeah, I knew I wanted to work with kids <clears> at the time. Um, and so I thought I wanted to be an attorney that like helped children and worked with children. But okay. my mentor was like, attorneys don't really do that. You don't get to see them that much. Um, you really don't work with them specifically more for them in a way. Um, and so my goal was to do sort of like child therapy or, um, something along those lines, like intervention with families and things. Yeah. Um, so it, it actually panned out to be exactly what I thought I, thought I wanted to do. So okay. that was perfect. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Nice. So then you, you got your master's degree and mm-hmm. then at what did you decide at that point to continue on towards the doctor? Yeah, actually yeah. I was always told not to get a doctorate in social work because okay. it's, it's not worth it. And, um, you should get a PhD instead. And cause a, a doctorate in a PhD are a little bit different in the sense that PhD is research and clinical, whereas the doctorate is more programmatic, um, building programs to address social needs. Um, and so I didn't think, um, that I would go back to school at that point. Um, I got a really good job that I really loved. And, um, so it wasn't actually my intention to get my doctorate until, um, I was working for a police department as a social worker and was like, this needs to be something that's everywhere. Why are we not doing this everywhere? I want to go back to school and learn how I can build these programs more effectively. Um, and so that's when I got uh, my doctorate. Okay. So. And how was that in, in working with as a social worker with like the police department? What did that look like for you? Yeah, so I had um, a partner that was a police officer and I rode around in their 
passenger seat. Okay. Um, and it was the two of us, our team grew. Um, and so we had a couple of os- officers and a couple of social workers. And basically we would just go out into the community um, and meet with people who needed services. Um, most often we were working with people who are experiencing homelessness, um, struggling with addiction. So we were just doing a lot of like housing support, um, some mental health support and getting people into drug treatment. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, that experience was amazing because you really get the opportunity to meet a population that you just don't, um, yeah. practicing social work by yourself. Um, and I have some pretty strong beliefs about like how our sort of emergency response system works right now. Um, especially after getting to know police officers and firefighters and knowing that, you know, their role should be pretty specific, but unfortunately they're having to work with, um, you know, outside of their scope really and helping. Um, so I was like, gosh, there's just a place for social workers here. Um, and so that's kind of what sort of just skyrocketed my ideas of, okay, what can I do next and how can I sort of solve this problem or work to solve it? So, so, uh, so I want to kind of go a little deeper into that. So with, when it comes to social work, um, there is, there's an aspect of, at least for, for someone that's uneducated like myself in it, Mm -hmm. um, I've had friends and friends of family that have worked in that. Um, but it can seem very one overwhelming, but two almost hopeless. Cause at first you have this boost of like, if we do this, this, and this, it could mm-hmm. fix this. And then yeah. as you have those conversations, you realize if you do th- certain things, it mm-hmm. causes new issues. And if you do yeah. these things, it causes issues. So in looking at that in like, C- like Seattle and, and mm-hmm. even outside of Seattle, we're seeing it everywhere due yeah. to, you know, lots of different reasons. What through that, your experience then, mm-hmm. what do you think is the most helpful thing that people can do to help people that are homeless or yeah. struggling or those type of things? Yeah, I'm. Oh, that's like the hardest question because um, I, there's a lot of things that can be done, but my perspective is really like we have to sort of trust the systems that are in place as well and fund those more. So okay. I feel like we just keep starting new things and <clears throat> putting money towards these new things and reinventing the wheel is always the greatest idea. And so if we can put more funding into things like community mental health, um, right now I'm um, partnered with the city of Arlington, um, with my other organization, the center for justice, social work. And one of the main reasons why we're partnering is because there's just a huge, huge lack of resources for, uh, mental health. And I'm even seeing yeah. that at Soundview. We are getting so many calls and I can hire a new clinician, but they're full within, you know, just a couple of weeks. And, um, and it's, it's just wild. There's just not enough resources. Um, and so if, if these organizations had more money to be able to hire more staff or retain their staff even, um, I think that that would be really, really beneficial um, and would really help Mm -hmm. um, bridge a lot of the gaps that we experience now. Yeah. So. Well, uh, so this also brings up another thing of, um, I would say even like, what is it, like 10, 10, 12 years ago when I was going to school. Mm -hmm psychology or social, you know, sociology or any of those degrees were very, I wouldn't say looked down upon, but yeah. just they were, weren't like, if you were going to go into a field that was going to be, you know, for success or whatever, yes. they're like go in the sciences or the engineering yeah. or, uh, or if you're a gal, like go to mm-hmm. teaching or you mm-hmm. know, nursing. But I, I feel like over the last 12 years, we've really seen this massive surge in yeah. counseling and psychologists mm-hmm. and these different aspects that, now, like, they're all full, and they, again, we need more, more. of them mm-hmm. um, in that. So what, yeah. as far as, like, your experience, since you've kind of been through that whole, that time period of this kind of explosion of that, yeah. um, how do you kind of see that, like, I guess, one, why do you think we're seeing such a greater need in that? Mm-hmm. And then how do you kind of see that field? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of work being done around stigma of mental health. Um, I mean, even like if you think back about how much did you talk about mental health when you were in elementary school or middle school, like you didn't, right? Right. You didn't talk about your emotions. um, And that's like 
fundamental to who we are as beings. Like yeah. it's okay to have emotions. It's normal. Um, and so a, I feel like a lot of work has been done around stigma and just in, including work around emotions in just our day-to-day work um, or in life. Um, and so I think that's helped a lot. Mm-hmm. And just a lot of movements around like, you know, mental health in general and even substance use um, as well, homelessness, things like that. So I think that has helped a lot to just let, like normalize the fact that people can benefit from therapy, counseling, social services, things yeah. like that. Um, it's definitely been in the media a lot more. I think social media has a huge aspect of it. You can really spread a lot of awareness around mental health in uh, those platforms. Um, but I think, I mean, I just see it continuing to grow. I think social workers and therapists belong in this like category of helpers and, um, wellness world. Um, I mean, I think they're, they should really be in a lot of different places. There's even social workers who specialize in finance, um, that work for banks. So, um, if an, you know, an older adult is, maybe not managing their funds as well anymore or something's yeah. happening, banks will hire social workers to actually take on those um, those individuals so that they can say, like, is everything okay? We noticed some confusing spending or, like, are you being taken advantage of or right. do you need some extra resources? So, I mean, there's a place for people to be helping in a lot of different venues yeah. that haven't been utilized before. Um, so I just see it growing more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. So then in that, so you were working um, alongside in, in, with the police department and you were seeing all these m- more issues and things like that. So what about getting your doctorate made you think that by taking that step, you could help in this? Yeah. Well, I've always been um, sort of the type of person that when I see a problem, I want to fix it. And in sort of the first responder world, it's very paramilitary, right? You sort of do your role and you sort of just stay in your lane and do your job. And I'm just not that person. (laughs) I don't function (laughs) like that. Um, I want to collaborate. I want to explore. I want to do research. I want to do all the things. So, um, so that just wasn't the right thing for me. Um, I, I mean, I grew up, my dad was a business owner and sort of, I saw him doing his own thing and how he could create what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just saw that as an opportunity to do my own thing and, And I didn't want to just jump into something willy-nilly unprepared. So I was like, okay, I need to learn really how do I build this and build it right and do it in a way that I can include all the right people and learn from really great um, individuals. So I felt like the next step was a programmatic type um, education. Okay. Um, So I considered actually getting another master's and then I was like, so the doctorate program popped up and I'm like, okay, no, that's a perfect fit for what I want to do. Yeah. So then what doctorate program did you go with then? So I went um, with USC, University of Southern California. So same um, platform and program that I got my master's through. Um, A lot of the same professors were still um, involved in that. I graduated from my master's in 2014. So, um, and then I just graduated um, in August of 2020 from my doctorate. So a few years in between, but um, a lot of the same people and a lot of the same sort of systems in place. So that was kind of a familiar um, fit for me. Nice. Well, congratulations. Thank That's great. you. Yeah, it was a lot of hard work, but definitely worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So mm-hmm. then um, upon getting out then, um, so you were doing this in 2020. Did you start Soundview right after or was it already started? Yeah. So I started my doctorate in August of 20. Oh, gosh. What would it have been? 2018. Okay. So then and I started Soundview June of 2020. So okay. um, I had been working um, in the hospital system for a while and doing school at the same time as that. I also worked with another um, police department as well, building a program for them. Um, and then, yeah, and then Zach was like, hey, there's this spot. We've always wanted a counselor. What do you think? And I'm like, sure. I didn't love my job. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, so yeah, so then I just started sound view and kind of just took off from there okay yeah so what was kind of in in starting that then what was your vision for sound view so my vision at that time was to create well I had a couple different visions because since I'm from here I have this like strong sense of community like I really believe in like giving back Mm -hmm. um So I really wanted to be able to create a place where people could feel comfortable coming for therapy. One, I know it's really hard to like 
even admit that you want to go to therapy right. Right? or that it's an option for you. And then when generally when you go, if you think of like going to a doctor's office, it's sterile, it's cold, it's not comfortable. So I wanted to create a comfortable place mm-hmm. um, for my community. But I also feel strongly that part of my community is also first responders. Um, and my husband's a firefighter. A lot of my really, really good friends are firefighters. Um, mm-hmm. And then obviously really, really amazing friends that turned into family that are police officers as yeah. well for my last position. So um, so I wanted to sort of create a place where I could serve the community, but also could really have a strong niche of working with first responders who have experienced some significant trauma. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And then, I mean, I, within, in July of 2020, it's actually when I um, started my, um, the Center for Justice Social Work. And it was just, it was part of my dissertation. So it was like, just sort of sat there for a while as I sort of worked on things. Yeah. Um, but then I quickly, you know, started picking that up and um, working more with other organizations to develop programs for them. So um, it sort of went hand in hand um, of kind of how Soundview would operate in sync with the Center for Justice Social Work. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, with the with the people that are in the both the any sort of emergency mm-hmm. response, um, you know, I've been able to sit down with um, Luke Plombeck, who's a local sheriff, mm-hmm. um, as well as uh, Lavon Young Gowan, yeah. if I said his name right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and that's come up on both of them of just mm-hmm. um, the mental health aspect yeah. of again, these people go through a significant amount of trauma. Mm-hmm. And twenty years ago, it was like just suck it up, like yeah. it's just part of the job. Right. Pull pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Mm-hmm. Get over it. Yeah. Yeah. And and they've they've made really big strides mm-hmm. with those groups, and now. It sounds like some of the bigger strides that they're trying to get stepped through are bringing that to the secondary as well, because the spouses of these these yes. people go through a lot of trauma, right. yeah. Um, you know, and they they have to work through that and how to work with someone that is going through that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just think that's yeah. really neat. So, would you say with Soundview, was there a specific? I guess I think of uh, counseling and stuff like there's lots of different. Mm -hmm. levels and then same with like therapy and stuff Mm -hmm. was there a certain aspect that you were really focusing on yeah so initially I just kind of wanted to get started and like when I got my master's I really thought I wanted to work with kids now that is not that is not my thing um I I have a counselor who's really great at that and it's just much harder to communicate with kids, I think, yes. um, than it is adults where my child therapist is like, oh my gosh, no, kids are way easier. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all about perspective. But um, so initially I just kind of took anyone because I was like, I think I want to, you know, I feel confident that I can provide services to a wide variety of people. And then from there, determine what my niche sort of is. Yeah. Um, and I quickly realized that sort of all throughout my career, trauma has been something that's super, super fascinating to me, how it affects the brain, how people end up functioning because of it. And so that was quickly my thing that I just started, um, started doing. And I'm also an EMDR provider. So I utilize a different, um, type of, um, therapy to address trauma in in the brain. So got it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And, and Soundview has a sort of, we have, a, like I said, a child therapist. We have another individual who works only with adults on things sort of outside of specific traumatic events. And then another counselor who also works with first responders. Okay. So, so yeah. there's now four of you guys then? Um, yes. There's okay. four of us. Yeah. Very so. cool. Wow. So you guys have really, I didn't realize how much you guys had grown over this last yeah. period. Yes. One person is pretty much full-time and then the other two are part-time okay um so yeah nice yeah very cool um so then how does this tie in with the center for justice social uh justice social work yeah um so the center is really an organization that will help cities police departments law enforcement agencies um, fire departments sort of develop a program that fits their specific community um, that will incorporate social work. And so I keep it kind of broad because every community needs something different. Yeah. Um, and so we have been working with um, the city of Arlington and building up a project that fits their specific needs. Um, and so I have four interns that are master's level interns. I have one that's a bachelor's level intern and they um, will receive referrals from police and fire and then respond to those community members and provide the assessments to determine like what's going on for this person, what's the root cause of their challenge. Um, and then 
you know, provide brief therapy, um, some sort of intervention, whatever they might need if that's crisis services or de-escalation or, I mean, it's a wide variety of things. Um, and then they also coordinate with other providers. So maybe they need, you know, a doctor or something, um, then they would um, assist with those services. Okay. So, so from a um, – so do you guys – like does the center – help build out the program so that eventually you can hand that off or is it building the program and then you guys are managing it? Um, it can be either. Okay. Um, but what I like to do, so with this one, it's a pilot project that was funded by the state. Um, and so this one, we, I helped to develop it. Um, and then, um, then I got the contract as well. So, and I think, I mean, it's easier for me to develop a program and then actually implement it. It's kind of hard to develop it and then hand it off to someone. Right. Um, so I kind of like that aspect, but, um, yeah. And I mean, the, the goal for me is to really have as many clinical type people in these sort of venues to make sure that, we're really enhancing our level of care for people who yeah. don't quite meet the necessary, you know, the, the requirements of an emergency physical health yeah, um, or even crime wise. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's just another project that you guys, that you basically are managing and yeah. maintaining and then working with your interns. And exactly. Stuff. And Soundview sort of fits in there because if someone needs, you know, more mental health services, then we can sort of refer off to our counselors um, or our counselors can be involved with helping our interns make sure that they're on the right path um, with the different services they're providing as well. Okay. So, and that's, I mean, my goal with the center was to have sort of this project that works with cities and make sure that social workers are involved, but also an avenue of like support for first responders and their families. And then the other piece of it where we will build, build programs for um, police departments and fire departments to have like a little bit more robust EAP program. Okay. Um, right now there are probably some great ones out there, but um, the most feedback that I get from you know, uh, police officers and, and firefighters is that they the, they don't really have the support mm -hmm. um, that they need to be successful. Yeah. Um, there's still a lot of stigma around yeah. it in those um, professions. And so I want to create a way that we can be more involved um, and make sure that people have the support they need. Yeah. Um, so, uh, a police officer that I was really good friends with died by suicide um, when I was in the middle of my doctorate program. Mm -hmm. So I added that piece of things that like, okay, we really need to be able to be involved more in that way yeah. so that it's not like, oh, you have to go talk to your captain about how you're feeling or your coworkers because they're also facing trauma right. and they're not, they're not skilled in mm -hmm. the, you know, the different things that they need to know right. to be able to intervene effectively. So, yeah. Well, and I think we all, it's, if we're dealing with something and someone else is dealing with it, um, we are reacting it, reacting to it our way. Mm -hmm. uh, and Emotionally. Right. Yeah. And trying to deal with that. And if someone else is coming to you as well, you're going to give them advice based on what you think you're doing and how you're going to right. react to it. Uh, and if you're, again, if you're not that trained professional or you don't have that yeah. understanding, you could say or give advice that's very damaging and right. the wrong direction. Uh, exactly. And, and it might not be the wrong information if it was someone talking to you, yeah. but it would be for someone else. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And when it comes to things like suicidal ideation or just mental health challenges that are super difficult, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can be, I mean, really a life or death situation. And so, um, a lot of times I try to encourage people, like if you are the person that someone is talking to, you know, reach out for help yourself yeah. because, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can help you too. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important to make sure that trained clinical licensed professionals, um, are, are assisting with those kinds of things. Yeah. 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 Um, just for clarification, what does EAP stand for? Um, employee assistance programs. Okay. So just like, you know, um, a lot of larger organizations will hire, um, specific EAP programs to assist with counseling type services, but yeah. oftentimes it's, um, it can be people in person um, or in your community, but sometimes it can be virtual or it can feel very much like, oh, my employer hired this person. Maybe my information's not as safe. That's generally the perceptions that I hear from people. Yeah. Not always accurate, um, but it doesn't really matter. You know, if that's what's in your mind and you're feeling uncomfortable with it, bottom line is do what you're comfortable with. Right. And if it's going to be not utilizing that service, then then that's what it's going to be. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I, I think one of the other things that I've realized in talking with both the fire department and, and police, um, we've also I've also uh, talked with uh, Ram Prashad, who does the uh, I forget, it's a very long name, but they help support the police department, yeah. the local sheriff department, mm-hmm. um, and how underfunded they are as well. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, any sort of secondary or tertiary program that's helping them, mm-hmm. which is benefiting them right. and helping them be sustainable long term is so below the budget line. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah. So what what are ways that you guys have been able to kind of work around that issue? Yeah. So with this program, we approached the state, so specifically Senator Wagner, and okay. asked um, if we could essentially provide um, a proposal to them to create a house bill. Um, and so that's actually what ended up getting the funding for the current program that we okay. have. Um, and so that's, I mean, and that's obviously not going to happen for everybody. And so uh, we feel very lucky to be able to have that. Um, and so it's a pilot project so we can really get as much data together as possible to show this needs to happen. This needs to happen in more communities. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of grants out there right now, um, for funding support. Also a lot of people who care strongly about their communities that can also assist. Um, we've considered a lot of ways of how can we sort of enhance this, Uh, A lot of people who will call even Soundview who will say, like, oh, I really want services, but I can't afford them. I don't have insurance. My insurance won't cover it. Right. Um, And really ranges of, you know, an hour-long session can go from anywhere to from $100 to $250. And so it's not really reasonable for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, And so even considering, like, how to sponsor someone or how to sort of get people who feel strongly about their community involved in funding these kinds of programs or assisting in funding it. Yeah. Um, even insurance companies, they have a lot to gain from something like this. Um, you know, if we can reduce people ending up in the emergency room, yeah. um, what an awesome opportunity um, for yeah. insurance companies right. to be involved too. So yeah, we try yeah. to get really creative with how we can um, find funding opportunities for yeah. cities and police departments. Yeah. And I think, you know, they're, they're definitely massive, slow moving beasts within yes. the insurance company world. But like, um, I think they're finally catching on certain things. Like there's starting to be different programs that they have within p- insurance programs mm-hmm. where you get discounts. If you're healthy, you don't smoke, yeah. you have, you know, certain right. things. And so maybe long term, that's something that they can add in. Yes. Of like that is, again, it's going to save them money in the long term if they help right. pay some of these short term mm-hmm. things. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the other thing for me in in looking at counseling and and when I was looking to to try it out and mm-hmm. things like that, um, leading up to that point, um, there was that stigma of like, okay, yeah. like if we're doing this, what does this look yeah, like? And who do you tell yeah. people and right. stuff like that? Um, but the other aspect was like, okay, so I'm gonna go in, it's an hour, and I'm gonna start talking, and then it's gonna be like hours over, and like yeah. you're done. And, like, how much am I going to get done? Yeah. And, and like, we live in a very, like, checkbox, accomplished-driven world. Right. So we're like, okay, is it two sessions? Is it three sessions? Just tell me now so I can... I I can prepare, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, how has... um, As you work with people as well, is that... um, Do you have to kind of work through a lot of that as well? Mm -hmm, Definitely. And my perspective is... I, I don't like to tell people like, oh, in 10 sessions, you're going to start, you know, feeling better because chances are good something else is going to happen in your life. And you're going to realize like, wow, I've been working on all these things. Now I have these new skills. And I'm also more mindful of like how I'm reacting or how my loved ones are reacting. So you're going to just want to start processing more. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of time, and unfortunately with insurance, um, you generally have a cap on how many times you can be seen right. um, with your coverage. And I, I just so strongly disagree with that because um, it's just not realistic yeah. um, to say, oh, and, you know, we'll go for three sessions and see how we feel. Like maybe if your life is so perfect and you, you know, had one bad thing that happened, sure. <laughs> um, but I think everybody can really benefit from sitting down with someone and really hashing out a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and talking to other people about counseling, um, I think the, there's so much, I don't know, I guess there's, so there's lots of different aspects of, of, as far as like the stigma goes, Mm because there's the stigma of like, oh, you need help. Like, right. Like how, 
why can't you work through your own problems? Mm -hmm. Um, There's also the stigma of, well, that's what friends and family are for. Right. And so there's all these different levels. But I think when I was talking to somebody about it, uh, I was going through like, it's just there is something free, uh, freeing about being able to talk to someone that has no relation to you Mm -hmm. of any sort no benefit or loss to whatever you say. Yeah. And you're able to be 100% just open and like what you're dealing with, what right. you're feeling. And, um, yeah. And yes, I think a lot of people think that that's what our, you know, our spouses should be yes. or our best friends should be. Totally. But we all are dealing with things. And exactly. so, you know, and there's, there's plus or minuses as you're telling people things. And yes, so, for sure. um, yeah, I just feel like yeah. it's, there's that openness there. Definitely. And I always tell people, like, I have a lot of clients who will say, oh, I want to know about you, though. Like, you know, if you don't <laughs> if you don't have a therapist or you haven't had one before, you don't <clears throat> know that really it's a one-sided relationship in a way. Yeah. Um, so I'll have a lot of people want to ask questions, and I always say, isn't it so amazing that this is the one and only relationship that you get to have right now where it's all about you? Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry if I'm okay or what's going on in my life or what kind of bias I will have because <clears throat> that's not our relationship. Our relationship mm-hmm. gets to be just about you and you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have another one of those. Yeah. And so um, that's generally how I say that because it is it is true. Like you don't you don't need to know anything about me. You're not coming to counseling to talk about me. You're talking about you. And um, that's a really beautiful thing, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, a big thank you to Dr. Caitlin Gubo for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to commandocommons.com slash podcast. That's commandocommons.com slash podcast. Be sure to come back next week for part two, and I'll see you next time.